of Philadelphia um, and uh, citizens of Philadelphia will talk about the North Central Choice Neighborhoods experience that Philadelphia is going through at this time. Um, I, since we are kind of short on time, I'll go ahead and introduce um, folks from Philadelphia first. Uh, Mark Dodds is from the city of Philadelphia and he will be, and here it is, <laughs> perfect timing. Um, uh, he will be sort of kicking off the presentation. Uh, then friends from the Housing Authority in Philadelphia will also be talking briefly about the housing transformation parts of it. Nick Dima, who is on the line, Andrew Maloney, who also just turned his camera on. Um, additionally, Lauren Bishop, who I haven't seen in a long time. Good seeing you, Lauren. Um, you look great. Um, we'll uh, be talking about some of the people initiatives of the Choice Neighborhoods Plan. And Marco, I don't have the pleasure of um, knowing you, but Marco Ferreira will also be uh, having a speaking role. Additionally, um, Kyle Flood is on the line as well. And I believe Kyle is uh, attempting to connect with Ms. Donna Richardson, who has the tail end of, of this presentation. So hopefully she was able to join at this uh, at the right time. So I know our friends in Philadelphia have a hard stop at six, and I want to make sure that the presentation is complete and there is time for questions. Uh, so please uh, bear with me as I share my screen. OK, can you guys see this? Give yep. me a, OK, sure great. OK, yes. great. Thank you. And I'll go to full screen mode. And I believe it's Mark. Yes, so thank you, Wu, and welcome, everyone. Um, I'm just going to jump right in it. I know we don't have a ton of time, so we're going to run through our presentation. Thank you for the introductions. And then uh, we, I know we have some time saved for questions at the end. So uh, anything comes up, then we'll be happy to address it. Back in 2014, PHA in the city, the city was the lead, PHA was the co-lead on the Choice Neighborhoods Implementation Grant. It's a $30 million grant uh, from HUD to redevelop Norris Apartments and revitalize the North Central neighborhood. Just to give everyone an idea of um, what we're talking about and the area we're talking about, Nick will probably go into this a little bit when he uh, talks about the housing piece, but Norris Apartments are located directly east of Temple University's main campus and directly west of a regional, regional rail viaduct. Further to the east of the viaduct is a, is a more traditional neighborhood with a lot of row homes and a lot of new development, much of which has happened since the start of the grant. Um, Norris homes or barrack style homes, you see a photo of them there. They've all since been raised or torn down. All the residents have been relocated um, but they, what's unique about choice grants, and I'm sure Wu has been talking to you all about this, is that every resident who was relocated in order for the homes to come down was given a right to return. So they were temp placed in uh, temporary housing and then they could make a decision whether or not they wanted to stay there or um, come back on site or to a scattered site home in the surrounding community. And when I say temporary housing, I mean uh, the, that could be temporary in terms of how long they stayed. It wasn't like a shelter or something like that. Um, next slide. Nick, do you want to jump into the housing piece and then I could follow you? Sure. Uh, so just a little bit more background about uh, the existing Norris apartments, because as you know, the choice grant has to be centered around an existing public housing site. And as Mark said, that was our Norris Apartments. Uh, Norris Apartments, um, as you saw on the previous slide, was kind of, you know, the barrack style of public housing, small units, really didn't meet today's design standards or amenities. Um, also, uh, this development contained 147 public housing units. Uh, also, it was located on uh, two different blocks uh, as well. Uh, and then also as part of choice, not only did we want to develop the existing campus sites, but we also wanted to do some offsite. Uh, so the plan, the overall plan was to come back with 302 new units 
Uh, and that consists of 147 replacement units, uh, which replaced the existing NARS um, units. We also added 95 new affordable units. We also had 30 market rate units. And also a component of this is home ownership. And we're doing uh, our, home, our home ownership through what we call our workforce home ownership model. And basically what that is, is that's where either PHA or the city will provide land for nominal consideration to a developer. The developer is responsible to obtain all of the construction financing, build the unit and sell it at an affordable price. And in our case, we're capping the sale price at an income level of 120% area median income and a capped sale price of $250,000. Uh, as you can see, uh, this is being developed over five phases. Uh, it's really four phases because the phase one and phase five, which are the two home ownership phases, we're actually doing those together. Uh, so they're currently under construction uh, and should be completed uh, by the end of this year. One of the phases actually is located on a portion of the public housing site. Uh, so we subdivided one of the NARS uh, sites uh, into two units, or I'm sorry, two parcels. One is a rental phase and one is a home ownership phase. Uh, so that kind of talks about our home ownership. Uh, the first rental phase, what we call kind of our offsite development. Uh, so these were all of the units that were developed off of the footprint of NARS. And the reason why we did this phase first was for a couple of reasons. One is we really want to minimize relocation uh, so the plan was that we could build uh, the first phase and then begin relocation uh, without disturbing the existing residents. Uh, this was a 4% uh, low-income housing tax credit development. Uh, PHA was the developer. Uh, this was all scattered sites. Uh, one of the challenges here was uh, to find lots in, this, uh, in the surrounding area that were either owned by the city of Philadelphia or PHA. So we spent some time really making sure that we had enough units to complete this phase. Uh, this was completed. It's currently 100% occupied as well. Uh, the next rental phase, uh, we came on to one parcel of the existing NARS apartments. Uh, and this was a 9% low income housing tax credit development. Uh, this is 50 rental units. Uh, there are 28 replacement units. 14 affordable new units and eight market rate units as well. In addition, uh, as you'll probably hear from Ms. Richardson later, um, going through this process, she created an awesome after school program. Uh, so one of the things that we've kind of changed in designing this phase when we were when we were looking at putting this particular phase together, uh, we needed uh, more space for the after school program. And we really wanted to make sure that we had an awesome space uh, so we actually built a 10,000 square foot community center as part of this development as well. And you'll hear from Donna uh, later, uh, you know, we kind of created uh, separate rooms in the community center uh, so that we have various opportunities to do different things with the after school program. Um, and we're really excited about that. Uh, the third rental phase uh, is being developed by our development partner. Uh, so when we, when we went in with our application back in 2013-14, we had a development partner, and that is Jonathan Rose out of New York. Uh, they're familiar with the neighborhood. They completed a, a large development, probably about two blocks from here. Uh, so, you know, we like that synergy. So they were selected as our development partner. This phase is currently under construction. Uh, so this is the last rental phase. It's also the largest phase. This is a 4% transaction again. Uh, this has 133 rental units. Uh, 45 of those are replacement units, 66 new affordable units, and 22 market rate units. Uh, in addition, this will have uh, some uh, small commercial space as well, and a lot of outdoor space. Okay. And just one last comment about our design and, and working with the residents at NARS. One of the things uh, that really kind of helped on our design was an emphasis to really have townhouse developments. Uh, so all of the PHA, the two PHA developments are 
predominantly townhouse developments. Uh, but the Jonathan Rose phase is a combination of townhouse units and a multifamily building as well. Uh, that This is a large parcel. Uh, so we really want to maximize uh, the use of that parcel. Next slide. You want me to continue, Mark, or? I think you covered pretty much everything. Um, folks may want to get a, these images kind of relate back to what you said. So this is kind of like more of the, if you want to take people through the next couple. Yeah, so th this is um, a portion in our off-site development in our first rental phase of the 89. Uh, another unique piece here, this corner building is actually a senior building. Again, working with the residents, we realized that we had a, a pretty large senior population. And one of the discussions that we had is we know seniors don't like to move a lot. So could we actually develop a senior dedicated building? Uh, so this building here is dedicated uh, to senior development. And you see, it looks like a commercial space on the ground floor, but that is actually the community room uh, that the seniors can use um, as part of the senior development. Uh, and you can kind of see our vision here was really to kind of create a townhouse style, uh, even though these are not necessarily townhouses here, uh, but we want to create the townhouse look and feel. Next slide. Uh, this is the development on uh, a portion of the existing NARS. Again, you can kind of see the townhouses uh, going up the street. And then this is the corner where we really anchored uh, the community center. Uh, as you can see, it's a bi-level community center. Uh, so it serves not only the after-school program, but also the residents uh, of this development, as well as the other developments as well. And then this is the, the last phase that is currently under construction from our development partner, Jonathan Rose. Uh, as you can see here, this is an image of the multifamily building, uh, but on the corners, um, you'll see that there are also townhouse style units uh, that are also adjacent to this particular building as well. And then you can also see here on the corner, uh, you know, Berg Street is a main thoroughfare uh, from the train station up to Temple University. Uh, so we anchored the commercial space here uh, because that'll give us the most foot traffic uh, for a commercial space. Okay, thanks, Nick. Um, I'm going to jump right into the neighborhood revitalization efforts that I mentioned at the uh, start of the presentation. So to complement the housing piece, really part, the main focus of the grant is to come up with some um, maybe four to six or so transformational big ticket projects that will um, make a difference in the community. And um, when you're kind of working with the community and pitching these ideas to HUD, HUD is looking for things that wouldn't typically be funded with city services. So they're not looking for, you know, sidewalk repairs or things like that, even though they're important, they're looking about for more transformational, innovative designs, um, solutions that, um, some of our goals that we set in, through the course of the grant and in our transformation plan were to improve safety, increase connections, provide job opportunities. So there's really an economic development component to this as well. Um, one of the things we were able to do in North Central is, is come back to HUD with a lot of additional funds, not just choice funds. So uh, we asked for 3.2 million in choice funds, but those were leveraged or backed up and supported by 12.4 million of additional dollars. And then those that came from state grants, uh, philanthropic resources, um, and other, um, other different funding mechanisms. Next slide. So I'm gonna take you through three of our main projects as part of the Critical Community Improvement Plan or the CCI plan. The first one and the first one to get built was a community kitchen. Uh, it does culinary training and life skills development. So what I mean by that, and I have a note here, uh, not only are they training people to become chefs or work in the culinary arts industry, but they're also providing supportive services. That model has been incredibly successful. Uh, you see here about 75% of participants are employed two years after graduation, so incredibly high success rate. And uh, the output has also been equally successful. Over 4 million meals to date have been produced. Um, 
Next slide. So this one is kind of unique. HUD typically doesn't fund improvements to recreation centers as part of their CCI plan. But what came about uh, in the course of working with the community, getting to know key stakeholders, was that it was a tiny rec center. This is a before picture here. It says current conditions, but a lot of that has changed. You'll see in subsequent slides. Uh, it's a very small footprint. Um, there's a multi-use room on site that was being used for, um, I don't want to say 100, but a ton of different uses. And it would, was a lot of strain on staff to uh, take down different setups and then put them back together again. So uh, we also learned that there was dedicated leadership at the rec center, that there was somebody working there for years who was committed to, you know, if we were to put resources into this rec center, would there be somebody there to maintain them and make sure that uh, there was staff in place and support for kids or adults visiting the facility. And these, this kind of checked off all the boxes. So uh, you see here, it wasn't in the great shape. Next slide. This is a rendering and this work is almost done. So I actually uh, anticipated to be completed later this month. Uh, 1100 square foot addition was put on there and you'll see glass was a major component of that. And that really came out of meetings in the community where people said, okay, if I'm inside of the community meeting or a community event, my kid is playing outside on the playground, I wanna be able to see them. So things like that it was a lot of outreach, a lot of back and forth with local residents. About what they wanted to see. The bottom rendering show uh, that kind of innovative playground equipment that that HUD was looking for. So that um, this is maybe equipment that you wouldn't find on a traditional playground uh, that seemed to come out of, uh, it seemed to satisfy HUD's concerns about being innovative, but it also met the needs of the community. A lot of the equipment was picked in consultation with the community through public meetings. And one of the things that we heard and I don't know if you can see it clearly, but in the bottom right corner, there's a spray ground. They're very popular in the city, a way to cool off in the summertime. They had this kind of um, barely functional little drip of water coming out and uh, we replaced that with some state-of-the-art equipment. Next slide. So one of the things that, one of the three CCI components that we actually did pitch to HUD in our original application was to do some improvements under the rail line that I talked about earlier. So you can see kind of uh, in the pink color on the left-hand part of the image, that's where Temple University is. Uh, as you move to the right, you'll see in blue, that's the old Norris Homes footprint. And then you see the rail line kind of cutting right through the middle of the neighborhood and then eighth and diamond playgrounds on the other side. So we feel like, and also Phil Abundance is up to the north of that community kitchen that I mentioned earlier. We feel like these uh, CCI improvements really complement one another. Uh, they're all located within pretty close range of, of the original Norris Homes footprint, but um, they're also not sandwiched together either. So this rail line really created a barrier for residents of Norris Homes, you have kind of Temple University looming to the west, this rail line to the east, and then a greater neighborhood beyond that. Um, that barrier, I think in turn, you know, uh, Ms. Richardson's on the call and could probably speak to this, has probably in a way uh, kind of facilitated relationships and, and really encourage residents of Norris Homes to get to know one another, lean on each other, but it also kind of, um, cut them off from the surrounding neighborhood, made connections difficult. So uh, next slide. This is what I mean by that. The, the rail line, this is, these are taken during the day, obviously, but at night uh, can be kind of a foreboding place. Late Thursday night. Um, maybe not a, a, an underpass that you wanna go under. We did some crime analysis. We found that a lot of cars were getting broken into around here, unsurprisingly, um, just kind of dark, um, inhospitable places, led to a lot of trash and illegal dumping, obviously problems with connections, residents getting from one side of the tracks to the other, and crime and safety were an issue. Next slide. So three intersections were improved, a ton of lighting was added. You can see this in each slide. Uh, almost every single light you see is new. Uh, oh, I don't want to... <laughs> 
go too far as to say almost too many lights were added, but um, when you drive under at night, it's lit up like a football stadium. I think that uh, a lot of concerns that we heard earlier have been alleviated. Plus we work with Mural Arts, a leading national recognized organization to install these murals, all done with extensive outreach, tons of um, the art, like community members had an opportunity to get to know the artists behind some of these murals. Um, and we're really, really um, satisfied with the finished product. Next slide. Okay. People plan, I, is that, am I kicking it over to Lauren? Yes. <laughs> Good evening, everybody. My name is Lauren. I'm the director of site-based and senior programs here at the Philadelphia Housing Authority. Um, the mission and vision of our case management team was just to increase opportunities um, for Norris residents to have access um, to services and supports to improve health, financial, and education outcomes. Um, currently, we have 380 residents that are participating in case management. Um, that includes residents that relocated from Norris, um, moved back to Norris, and are new to the North Central community. Our caseload will continue to grow over time as we engage residents that are new to the North Central community and interested in learning about PHA and partner programs. Um, currently, we coordinate with partners and other PHA programs, including our PHA Workforce Center. Um, Marco will probably dive in that, especially with home ownership. Um, financial Literacy, our partner Clarify, Temple University, Power Corps, and the Force of uh, Philadelphia Career Link System. Um, one partnership I want to highlight is Temple University. Um, they're currently leasing out the old Norris Community Center. Um, so that way they can offer youth and young adults programming. Um, and that's everything from workforce development um, for youth that are interested in the healthcare industry, a Temple E3 program, which focuses on education, employment, and opportunities for young adults, and um, some college credited programming as well. I also want to highlight our financial education services. Um, we had two case managers throughout the CNI um, grant that really engage residents around their long-term financial goals. Um, I just met with our program manager there now. We were at 50, but now 60 residents are actually interested and in, um, have been referred to Clarify um, to start their financial education process, credit counseling, and also um, home ownership um, orientation as well to really focus on those long-term financial goals. Another area we focused on was barrier removal and um, supportive services. Um, we wanted to make sure that we had supports in place to support our residents um, with their goal attainment. Um, that could be transportation when they gained employment, um, started training, child care fees, and that could be initial costs, registration um, until the subsidy started, tools and books for school. Um, we also work with local partners for food vouchers for families in need and a new resource for our new to Norris residents um, for furniture resources that they might need when moving into their unit. Um, for case management efforts and outreach, um, do, uh, before COVID-19, I think our case managers had a great rapport with residents, so they responded to phone calls. Um, now we still do phone calls, emails, and in some cases, door-to-door, -door, just to make sure that we connect with residents, engage them so that they're aware of our services. Um, we continue to engage residents now in preparation for our training programs and cohorts as they come back online after being suspended for a period due to COVID restrictions, um, just to make sure that residents are still engaged in joining different training opportunities, uh, prepare them for the recruitment process or testing and even resume building. Um, as part of our sustainability plan um, to maintain the people um, component, um, we're actually now in the endowment period um, that was established at the end of the CNI grant. So that way we can continue our case management and social coordinated services and also our after school program um, with Donna's team um, to make sure those services continue throughout the grant. And that period is for about three years. Um, and during this endowment period, we were able to bring on a program manager to offer support day to day to our case managers and outreach worker, um, partner with our resident leadership partners in the North Central area. And we're hoping um, as the world opens up some additional small gatherings and activities 
um, outside in the, in the Norris area and also um, in the North Central Community Center. So I believe I'm passing it over to Marco. <laughs> Thanks, Lauren. Good evening, everybody. Uh, so again, my name is Marco Ferrer. I'm the director of the PHA Workforce Center, which contains uh, the homeownership program for any and all Philadelphia Housing Authority resident, head of household or household member that's looking to become a homeowner. Um, so we have every uh, PHA resident go through a three-step, what's called the homeownership readiness process. Um, everyone goes through that, uh, through that process to make sure they're at a good level of education of wanting to buy a home and in, in its uh, end result of it. First step is credit counseling. Uh, everyone needs to go through it, irregardless of whether they have the best credit score out there. Uh, upon graduation of that first step, they must have at least a 620 credit score and at least $2,000 saved. Second step is completing housing counseling. We have over 30, 25 uh, approved housing counseling agencies in the city of Philadelphia. Uh, they can choose any one of them. Uh, minimum hours of completion for that certificate is eight hours. Uh, I say minimum because everyone's different. So some people might want not have eight hours and they're good. Some might want 10 or 12 or 15. So everyone's different along their pathway of understanding housing uh, of, as a homeowner and what's need to be done post um, graduation of becoming a homeowner. And then the third step is obtain and receive a mortgage pre-approval. Uh, it, it's from any lender in the city of Philadelphia that um, is banked and licensed and, and, and approved, of course, by the Department of Banking for the state of Pennsylvania. Uh, and that gives us a barometer of what they can afford and so forth. Uh, there'll be times where they can stop the process and, and if they want to uh, afford more, uh, we can uh, increase different levels of helping reduce their debts, uh, but also being referred back to the PHA Workforce Center or Lauren's team in the North Central uh, area of getting additional... <laughs> My apologies. It's a joy of having two dogs in the house. Uh, so uh, my, my apologies for that. Can you get them? Uh, UPS man, of course. So um, everyone is um, in different of income level and getting pre-approved by a different amount. So basically, if they want to uh, buy more, uh, they would have to go through a job training program, increase their income, uh, and thus get pre-approved for additional services. Um, so then there's this step for Norris residents and also any PHA resident who's looking to become a homeowner. Uh, this is a third program that was approved uh, and created under my jurisdiction for the last uh, seven years. I've had the homeownership program. And this program is something that's really near dear to me because uh, it wasn't a program created by PHA. It wasn't a program created by the city of Philadelphia. Uh, and it wasn't a program uh, created by HUD itself. Uh, this program was created by the residents, by PHA residents. Uh, for the last seven years, I've heard their issues of how they couldn't become a homeowner in the city of Philadelphia, if it became gentrification as an issue, if it became of losing bids by $1,000, uh, or if it was just a restriction that we didn't have any sort of homeownership program for non-head of households. So uh, through various levels of resident engagement of all levels, resident councils, residents, and so forth, we recreated what's called the Mobility Homeownership Program. And that allows any PHA resident, Philadelphia Housing Authority residents, receiving assistance from PHA, 18 years or older, they could be head of household or non-head of household, household member, uh, if they're on time with their rents and utilities, uh, and they are on time with their lease or the head of household on time with their lease, uh, they have the ability to receive up to $50,000 in down payment closing cost assistance, which is then uh, forgiven over 20 years in one day. It is a, what's called a soft second mortgage. Um, it is during a period if an individual does receive assistance from PHA, the individual will not pay any interest on it. It will not pay any payment on it. It will not pay any fees on it. Uh, basically what we need to do is make sure the resident is able to buy the property properly, able to afford their first mortgage uh, on time properly, pay their taxes on time, and also their uh, monthly yearly homeowners insurance. If that ha happens over 20 years, uh, the entire balance that we provide from day one for that assistance is forgiven. And it's, it's recast low uh, every year on, on anniversary dates. So if I give Ms. Smith $20,000 from, uh, from Norris, uh, every year when she, bought, when she lives in that property and paying her taxes on time and so forth, $1,000 is forgiven each year. 
So it is a really aggressive and really promising program for, uh, for the Philadelphia Housing Authority, especially for its residents. Uh, we've had already had five homeowners already so far this year that took advantage of that program. Uh, seven or, took advantage of it last year. And we've been recording uh, over 70 new homeowners each year um, uh, with our readiness process and helping residents become homeowners. So we have a really good, strong sustainability program. And the mobility homeownership program would not be around if it wasn't for um, the residents providing this program. So. Um, have a good evening. I'll be on, of course, and my dog says uh, goodbye as well. So I'll be back on mute. I believe um, I'd like to introduce Donna Richardson. Um, Ms. Richardson, are you on the line? Yeah, um, it looks like you're muted, so. Okay, apology. Just as soon as I went to turn my ear down, you called on me. <laughs> well, hi, everyone. Um, I can speak on the process that we all went through, but to the Trenton community, I want you to think of what do your community want? And once you can identify your wants and your needs, then you can present something to PHA to where you want to be at in your lives. Um, we knew that we needed a lot of different programs. And as we told them of our programs we needed, we knew we needed um, someone, people wanted to buy homes. So yes, they did need credit counseling. And so yes, they put um, credit counseling in there. We knew that our children needed better schoolings. And so what we did was design an after school program that would filter around them so that we can get the test scores and the reading levels and the math um, levels up. So that's where the after school program came from, but it came from three residents, just so you all can know that was not getting paid, that took and volunteered their time and service to better serve what was in their community and where they see that the school system was attended was I'm not provided to the of our children. So some of the work some you have to do is coverage for yourself, but in the long run, it will pay off. Um, PHA has been very helpful through every process. I was, it was so helpful. I was un, it was unbelievable. I must admit. Marco Home Ownership Program is outstanding. It is outstanding. I sent so many people to them, and I have not seen one unsatisfied person yet. Lawrence and her team have come together, and they do a lot of work on case management. And when the residents cannot reach them, they'll reach me, and I built them right back to them because I know what a great opportunity they will have by going through the case managers and with the work that they put in. And it could be just someone you wanted to hear, someone to hear you. It may not have nothing to do with housing, but Ms. Cooper and her team and will sit there and they will listen to you because Ms. Cooper and them who are case managers are residents. They base this all around the residents. So every program that you see has a resident of Philadelphia Housing Authority in that program. So it will never be someone who don't understand where you're going at or where you came from. They are residents. The program that you see, it made us stand up more. When we realized they were coming in to help us, we wind up and we start doing a STEM program where we wind up being awarded and winning all across the board for this wonderful STEM program and just to give you an idea, we had a young man who built an engine and people thought he can't build an engine. Well, he could. We had one young man who can tell you all the body parts and the reason why, because he was a heart survivor of three times. The reason why I'm telling you this because if it was, would not have been for the Choice Grant and the city and I'm coming in to offer us this, we would not have known the potential of the community people that lived in that community. They will still be living in a bubble. Now you have people who are faced with beautiful jobs, Kids are not dropping out. They're graduating from school because they see a future where the ones they never did see a future. You have people walking out of their homes. You've seen the houses prior to this where they could have beautiful structure inside. But when you walk outside, you put your head down low because people looked at you and you felt in shame. Now they're walking out in pride and they are proudful to tell people where they live at, which all outsiders are trying to come in now. Where they once wouldn't want to step a foot in there, but they're trying to come in now to take over what was built off the back of that community. 
Well, the community was not going to let you take it from them. And they didn't mind sharing, but they were going to get what was suggested to them. And that's what the community is doing. Um, anyone from Trenton has a question that you would like to ask me, feel free. There's not a department in it. And Mark and Melissa from the city, high five, because if Melissa was on here, she'd be like, high five. I don't Y'all have to see if she has the most energetic spirit. But they <laughs> heard. They heard us. The city heard us. Listen to what I'm saying. The city heard us. And they went along and they walked side by side. And also the mural that you've seen on the wall, you see a, a gentleman with a crown. He was one of the oldest male who held the house of great excuse in Norris. And he passed away um, just about a year ago. But look at the memories we have of him on that wall. And he went because he was the oldest male that was in the whole community raising his family. I don't know what else I can really tell you all, but it's a beautiful opportunity. And I see people that thought they couldn't see that they can. And I've seen this community raise up. And I've seen people do some remarkable things, children going to college, parents getting better jobs, getting the, even down to birth certificate help if you need a child care, clothing, like, Everything was positioned. It was nothing to stop you but you. If you didn't want to move forward and you just didn't, but that's okay. No one judge you for it. But if you want to, everything was lined up for you to be able to do so. Right now, we have a staff of eight going up to 10 for summer. And these staffs are moving and we don't try to keep them there, but we try to hold them so until they move on. One young man just left and became a PAJ employee. Another young lady left and she's a teacher. So they're moving forward. And the only one can stop you is you. I'm gonna stop now and I don't know who should come on behind me, but I'm passing it on. Thank you so much, uh, Ms. Richardson. Thank you for that. Um, I, I see the applause, I, we, I can't hear it. I hope we can all hear it, um, but it's muted. Um, yeah. So. Um, I did, we do have um, folks from Philadelphia who had to jump. They have another Zoom meeting at six. So um, I think we've already lost a few of them, but I do, I am taking notes. So if uh, folks at, in Trenton have questions, um, please unmute and ask those questions. I do wanna address any sort of urgent questions while we have Ms. Richardson um, here on the line. Uh, this is Sherry Garrett. I, I wanted to, um, if I may speak. Absolutely. Oh, I uh, want to commend Ms. Richardson because she really, you know, the, 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 um, the presentation and the, um, the um, PowerPoint slides, I mean, with the information, it drew me in, but she really uh, closed the deal. Um, because I, I, I'm, I'm very much impressed to hear that, you know, the community came together and it really benefited young, the parents as well as the children. And um, that is key um, uh, is, you know, being able to, you know, I think the, the program in Philadelphia to me sounds like that really went beyond um, in, in, um, in a manner of, sorry, in the manner of providing like the STEM programs, you know, or, uh, uh, or um, setting up like vocational opportunities for people to be able to, or uh, some type of uh, educational program uh, where they can enhance or enhance or decide to go into, you know, careers that benefited the whole family and the community. It sounds wonderful. It sounds like a dream, um, but I'm impressed. You know, wonderful. It, it, uh, thank you. I'm I'm glad I'm I'm, I'm a part of this um, the the presentation from Philadelphia. It's Norristown. Is that correct? Norris Homes. Norris Homes, okay, yeah. and it's near Temple University. Is yes, that right? but, yes, but the new name is the North Central, but there's still Norris Homes residents. And just to give you, I see you have some seniors there. 
I just want to let you know, we wrap around everyone because we have a beautiful senior program. And also PHA comes along with us because we um, always make sure we do things with senior and also PHA do. And tomorrow will be a wonderful uh, Mother's Day grab and go that PHA provided to Cater's Lunch. And we did all the gifts like flat screen TVs. So as a team, it always works. And our senior building is beautiful. And our seniors are always involved as much as anyone else. Yeah, how did you get them involved? Because um, it just, I mean, how do you get people motivated to see the, the, um, the follow through? For one thing, follow through and to, you know, because it sounds like you, you, you hit all the um, areas that to help people, you know, as far as employment, as far as, you know, the actual neighborhood, maintaining the neighborhood, being involved, like you're saying, as a, a close knit community. Um, how do you get that mindset? How did, you know, I, you know, I, I, one thing you said was that's what the people wanted, but did everybody want it? How did you get the cohesiveness? That's, that's the part I, I'm trying to see that make it happen here in Trenton. How did you get the cohesiveness where people follow through and, you know, uh, participated, you know, just wanted to, just to, 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 you know, elevate how, what was the motivating factor, you know, cause I know it didn't happen overnight and this process of what you just, you know, was presented to us. I know that took over some time, like a year or two to get, you know, you know, the planning pre-positioning, getting the, you know, um, you know, uh, people, you know, uh, those uh, community meetings and what, how did you keep it going? What, what was the glue is my question. Well, trust and love was number one. Once they trust you and you truly love them, you'll never let go of them. And what I did was I heard their cry. I let them tell me what their needs was and what they wants were. It wasn't easy. I took a beating, I took a beating but it was worth the beating. Someone has to take it. You can't, you can go home and cry. Oh, they say, this one say they love me. This one say they don't. You have to really believe that whatever you're doing, if you believe and know it to be true, that it's for the greater of mankind, continue to do it. They will turn over. I was able to walk into a community program and tell the drug dealers no more. And out of the respect they had for me, they moved. Now, remember when they move, they're going to move to another location. So then I have to make sure that we had lighted areas because in the light, you can't hide. And once PHA, I talked to them, every time I seen a light out, I need it in. Um, I need a patrol officer to come. It's a gang of people. And then I had to find something for them. Besides just saying, oh, you're a drug dealer. I want you out of here. You're sending them to another neighborhood. I had to go out and find places that would hide them also that maybe was not connected to PHJ or the city, but would hire them with a criminal background. And when, once they seen that I had a place that would hire them at good wages of $19 an hour, they was coming off those corners, they was coming off of those oh. alleyways, and they were going into employment. As a resident leader, PHA can do what they can do, the city can do, but we are the ones who have to do it day in and day out, because that is our lives. When they office closed, we're still here. You must remember that. Mm -hmm. Then you look at your children. You may have a mother that's on substance abuse. Don't judge her, but look at what you stand to lose. She's a mother of three and four and five. What's going to happen with these children? They're going to be in the system. Or is this going to be a recycle? You have to find a way to break the recycle. And people know when you're being real and when you're really there. It's not, you can't go in and think, I'm off your job, you should take it. You may have to offer that job 90 times until you find a program or a job, whatever it is, that would kick that light in up. But you cannot give up because that's why the world is in the trauma it is in now. We've given up and we submitted and just think it's okay to go in our corners, but somebody gonna come in your corner and get you. So just so, and just so you all would know, um, in 2019, I lost a son to gun violence and the one thing that kept me going with this loss of my child was when I found out he lost his life protecting the child. He lost his life from doing what? He protected the child. He covered oh, the child. Okay. And they came to that community when he was taking his son home and they were shooting. 
He covered a child and my son got shot with a child he wrapped in his arm just to save. So I realized what I had presented out in the atmosphere had installed in my kids. Without a second thought, all he thought was what his mother had always showed him, to love someone else, to do for someone else. And he said, an innocent child. And it got me through the tragedy. But you all have to stand up. You got to come out of the dream. So much stuff is possible. That senior building that you see was not even instructed in there at first. And when we sat at the table with PHA and housing in the city, they said, you know what? Wonderful idea. Wonderful idea to give them a little place of their own where they don't have to be in the playgrounds or a multi-building where kids are running up and down. Not nothing wrong with it, but they're kids. That's what they're going to do. But the seniors right. also want what they want. So how do you give them in their last day, they peace, they glory. And that's what we had to come up with. But as a team, it works. Now, the team is not going to always see eye to eye, but you cannot get personal when you give up. You have to remember it's different views. In time, whatever's best for overall for everyone, it'll come together. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, I, I, um, I'm not sure how I can follow that up, but um, Christy, um, do I have your permission to move on to the next part of the presentation? Okay. Okay. Yeah. Do you, if it's a quick question, let's ask it and address yeah, it. Yeah, just a quick question. Um, sure. Thank you, Ms. Richardson, for your presentation. I see uh, many of the residents here at the Trend Housing Authority, and um, in you, in the same same type of people that are out there and want a better community. So um, with that being said, how have uh, the law enforcement, how have they, their part in this transition? How has that been, if any? Wonderful. Um, I have a great relationship with the chief of police and her team at PHA. Also with the um, captain of Temple University and May team, and also with some of the city uh, police officers and that helps, it works a lot as well. I'm, I'm gonna sum it up really quick. At any time, if you all have a meeting and request that I come, I will come because I know sometimes these meetings doesn't give you all that you want, but I know it could be a scary process, but it could be a blessing and an award at the same time. So if any time I'm needed, just reach out to PHA, they will let me know. Thank you, thank you so much. And just so everyone knows, um, I'm working with the Trenton Housing Authority to figure out how to get residents actually physically to Philadelphia so we can all meet Ms. Richardson and follow up with even more information. Um, so this is not the last time you'll, you'll see our friends here and hear about this project. Um, so Christy, is it okay to move on? Yes. Okay. Um, so thank you, Ms. Richardson. Thanks, Kyle, for everything. Um, and Lauren, Mark, uh, thank you so much. Um, I will now um, transition over to, uh, can everyone see my screen? Yes. Okay, great. Yes. Um, yeah. So I'd like to uh, introduce uh, my friends from Jersey City, um, Sandy Santos Garcia, uh, is a chief architect at the Jersey City Housing Authority. Uh, she's on the line. Um, and Jonathan Lubonsky is a VP of development at the Michaels organization, which is an affordable housing developer. Um, Mario Milano is also with the Michaels organization. And you'll talk a little bit about resident services um, and management as well. Um, I believe we also have Jahida um, with Michaels. And I think, if I'm not mistaken, Lisette, who is the site manager at uh, Lafayette Gardens, which we'll hear about, as well as Mr. Alan Small, who is a resident at the senior building there. Um, am I missing anyone, Jonathan? No, I think you've, got, you've covered the team. Great. So I actually have a speaking role um, on this one, and I'll be tag teaming with Sandy um, on this project. So. Um, this is a, a HOPE 6 project. So the previous project that you um, had the opportunity to view 
uh, was a choice project. And choice is a relatively new program and therefore buildings are under construction now. Uh, Hope 6 has been around for a couple decades longer than choice neighborhoods. And so there are a lot of completed uh, neighborhood transformation projects. And this is one of them. Um, Lafayette Gardens in Jersey City, New Jersey, um, very similar to Donnelly Homes, uh, built around the same time, uh, obsolete public housing, barrack style, um, much larger than Donnelly, in this case, about 500 units. It was uh, Jersey City's oldest and largest public housing development, uh, covering about 11 acres altogether. And it was certainly uh, a part of a, a distressed neighborhood and, um, and in need of transformation. The Hope Six Award that was uh, awarded at the time, it was 2001. It was about a $34 million grant. Um, and it is certainly sounds like a lot of money, but it's certainly not. Um, and, and Jonathan will talk about that and how much capital it takes to transform a development of this size. Uh, but it certainly was catalytic seed money to uh, get all the phases of development going. Um, Hope Six was very focused on um, just housing and the public housing site. Unlike Choice Neighborhoods, it wasn't uh, that focus on the larger neighborhood. And that's one of the things that Choice Neighbors is looking to address. And also a big difference is that Hope Six did not have a one-for-one -one replacement. So you'll see here that um, not all the units were built back, but um, we do have greater income mixing, uh, which has been a tremendous asset to the neighborhood. Um, this is a, a footprint of Lafayette Gardens. Uh, as you can see, it was uh, 11 acres of barrack style housing, uh, completely foreign to the Jersey City grid. Um, and you can see the aerial photography taken about 20 years ago um, at the time. A lot of vacancy in the neighborhood. Um, we were in, WRT was involved in this project. Um, many community meetings um, in church basements, building basements. Um, meetings with drawings. Um, I actually really um, miss these days when we can meet in person and, um, and, and share a meal together and sketch over things. And I, hopefully that day will come soon. Um, but one of the things we heard uh, from residents was that the seniors uh, wanted to go first. Um, you know, they, they said, you know, we don't have a lot of time left and uh, we wanted to make sure that we um, get first dibs on new housing. And so we listened. This is the, the master plan, the larger site plan that's developed. I won't spend too much time on this. It's just to show uh, the layout of all the units, the parking that's behind the units, the development of new streets, uh, the, the honoring the, uh, the Morris Canal, which is a, a historic uh, canal right of way. Um, and there is a, a interpretation sort of walk uh, to that. And a lot of, a lot of uh, correlation to Trenton, which is also a very historic city uh, with a historic past. And this is the site today, uh, post-transformation. So, you know, very much uh, stitching back to the city grid um, and in a very vibrant part of Jersey City. Sandy? Thanks, Ru. So um, I've actually been with the Housing Authority throughout this um, entire revitalization process. Um, I was part of the team to prepare the application for the HUD grant, the HOPE 6 grant rather. Um, and I saw construction from the demolition all the way through final occupancy. So I've been through the process from beginning to end. Um, it took a little over 10 years um, from when the first building got built to the last building. Um, so it was quite a lengthy process um, over multiple phases on site, and we had um, two off-site um, properties as well. This was the first phase, um, and I, you know, going back to what Wu was saying, um, we wanted to cater to our seniors first because um, they knew that they didn't have much time, and we they wanted to take advantage and um, be the first ones to uh, reoccupy the, the site. Um, and that sculpture that you see in the front courtyard was actually a sculpture um, by a local artist that we were able, that was um, originally installed 
in the 1940s on the original development that we were able to reinstall back onto the site as a homage to the previous Lafayette Garden site. Um, some of the um, uh, some of the amenities for Lafayette Garden for Lafayette Senior um, include uh, a community room. There's laundry facilities on every floor. Uh, there's a game and billiard rooms for the guys, and then for the ladies, there's a hair salon. Um, there's also a visiting uh, doctor's office available for residents, and we've also um, designed a raised garden bed for the seniors. You can go to the next slide. Um, this is phase two, um, Woodward Terrace. Um, as you can see, uh, it's a townhouse development style um, family apartment built, um, uh, townhouse development. Um, there's 70 units on this particular phase. And um, as you can see, each um, unit has its own front door um, onto a street front. Um, that was one of the things that um, was incorporated as part of the overall plan is we wanted to reconnect all the streets into the existing um, adjacent neighborhoods to connect the development to the rest of the, um, the city. Um, as, as we can, uh, I, I think we can all agree that the previous designs of the super block um, really isolated public housing developments. Um, and especially this one, because it was um, uh, bifurcated on one side by a railroad track. So, um, you know, it was really important for us as part of the design to reconnect this community to the rest of the city. And as you can see here, you know, we built new streets and everyone has a front door. Um, we involved the, you know, the community was involved through the design process. Um, one of the requests that they um, had, you know, other than larger units, um, you know, they had amenities just, just such as dishwashers for the first time. Um, one of the requests that they also had, which was unique was they felt like they needed, um, you know, storage for bicycles, which is not typical of, you know, a public housing unit. You don't normally have that type of storage for that type of stuff. So one of the things that we provided at, at these developments was we have an outdoor shed for the units so that they can store things like bicycles and, and things of that nature. Um, and this is another on-site family phase. Um, this particular phase had um, even more amenities to it. Um, as you can see in this picture, there's a tot lot for, um, for young children. Um, this particular phase also has a community room, um, which is in this photo, pictured in this photo as well with the pitched roof. Um, and in that particular building, there's also a management office space uh, computer, um, access to computer facility, uh, laundry facilities, and an exercise room for residents. Um, this is one of the offsite properties. It's also a senior development. Um, this was actually a property that uh, we acquired from the city um, to build this development. And um, there's 59 units here. All of the senior units um, in this development, as well as the previous one shown, all of the units are handicap adaptable. Um, this particular development also has laundry rooms on every floor, uh, community room, uh, computer room, game room, and a TV slash library room. Um, so as you know, um, this uh, right here is a perfect example of something that doesn't go according to plan. So as we said earlier, Hope 6 was really more about building housing and not incorporating any other type of, um, you know, facilities. Um, 
other than some of the on-site community rooms that we that we were able to incorporate. Um, this particular parcel of land, we were unable to build housing on because it had some environmental issues that prevented us from doing um, you know, what we wanted to do on this site. Um, so we uh, partnered with, um, there's a, a, a charter school right across the street from this parcel who was looking to expand um, to, um, to include a middle school. And so we um, basically sold them the land and um, they built this uh, uh, char charter school, which is a middle school, which added you know, the capacity for the school that's across the street. And they were able to um, accommodate a larger population of not only our residents, but other residents in the community. Um, and you know, this really is an anchor to the community um, because you know we're not just building more housing. Now you're 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 providing an amenity um, that's serving the residents of that community. Thanks, Andy. And uh, you know, I'll speak to this slide here. Um, you know, this is about twenty years after award of the grant and. Um, the, the, the HOPE 6 grant, it's supposed to catalyze things like this, which is to transform neighborhoods so that private sector comes in and starts investing. Um, this is an example of a building that is fully operational now uh, that opened up uh, last year. It's called 295J. It's 300 units of market rate housing. Um, it's right at the footsteps of Liberty State Park um, and only a few blocks away from the Lafayette Gardens uh, redevelopment. Um, I'd also like to use this opportunity to introduce Jonathan Lebonsky, uh, who will talk about the uh, development side and the management side of things. Yeah, good evening, everyone. Uh, pleasure to be here. Uh, I've been with the Michaels organization um, for about eight years and started my career uh, in affordable housing 15 years ago. And um, I started my career as uh, working for smaller boutique developers where we worked on smaller affordable communities. When I joined Michaels, Lafayette Gardens, um, when I joined Michaels in 2013, Lafayette Gardens was the first property that I toured. And I was just amazed at the large scale revitalization um, and just the impact that uh, affordable housing could have um, in an urban area, since my experience was uh, up till then was largely in, in suburban markets. Um, so it's a tremendous, it's a tremendous community, a tremendous accomplishment for everyone involved. Just a little background: it started um, uh, started way back in 2001, similarly to um, a pathway that Trenton is taking um, through an RFP process, and and Michaels was selected as the development um, partner. Uh, this was a Hope Six revitalization, which Sandy and Wu covered the differences between CNI and um, and the Hope Six program. Overall, it was seven phases, a total of 478 units. It took 10 years of um, you know a lot of work, which Sandy was a part of uh, every every step of it. I was fortunate to come in at the very tail end and do the uh, work on the last phase and. Um, um, but it, it was a uh, it, it was the significant transformation of Jersey City's largest public housing development, um, and and, and uh, there it won some awards as well. Um, well, you could um, okay. So a little bit about the uh, the unit mix again. The community process is extremely important in um, developments like this, and. Um, one of the things that, that we aimed, that, that, that the team aimed to achieve was a diverse mix of bedroom unit of bedroom types. Um, this shows you, uh, you know, senior properties are largely, if you look at the top Lafayette Senior Living Center, the first phase, those units for seniors are largely one and two bedroom units, and that's typical of senior properties. Um, the rest of the units were to accommodate families. So we have a good mix of one, two, three, and even four bedroom units to accommodate 
large families. And the image to the right is um, is a floor plan of the last the last phase, Glenview Townhouses Two. And this is just to show the modern design, the modern layout, the larger sizes, completely different than uh, traditional public housing. Open concept floor plans. Um, you know, thoughtful thinking in terms of energy efficiency, um, energy star appliances, um, quality, high quality materials, um, modern feel, um, something that the residents can be proud of. And again, the residents were part of every process, every step of the process, and, and so much as uh, selecting, you know, species of trees. Um, uh, uh, so very, very comprehensive uh, planning process with the community. Um, this slide here um, is, is illustrating uh, the different mix of uh, income types. Again, choice neighborhoods is about community. Hope Six was more about replacing uh, public housing and, um, and incorporating a mixture of incomes. So this, what this table here shows is um, the different um, housing uh, assistance that was incorporated and utilized in the project. So we have public housing units that uh, were affordable for residents up to 80% of area median income, um, tax public housing um, and tax credit units that were affordable up to 60% of area median income. We incorporated section eight housing for our section eight residents and who are affordable up to 50% of area median income. Tax credit units, again, up to 60% of area median income and then um, unrestricted market rate units. This was an important goal uh, of the HOPE 6 program that, to ensure that we included a diverse um, mixture of incomes and that included unrestricted units, charging market rate rents. And, what, and the goal of that was um, to bring uh, higher income residents in and, and ultimately um, it would help to catalyze some of the private investment that we we'll, that we'll described. And then we also have um, an important superintendent's unit having a 24 hour on-site presence to deal with resident needs, uh, which we try to include in every phase. Um, in the case of um, a development like this, um, we have super, a superintendent presence uh, since all the projects were, were in close proximity to each other. Um, here's some photos of the amazing amenities that we uh, included. And again, this is, this is asking what the residents want. We actually had a beauty salon, the top left picture, um, where um, uh, hair professionals would come in and style the seniors' hair, um, community centers, fitness centers. One of the main requests from seniors was a billiards room, and this was kind of like the man cave. Uh, uh, but I know the ladies utilize this this room too. Um, and then and then you see the community gardens, and um, you know visiting the community gardens. There's everything from flowers to you know corn and vegetables, and and um, so really the community gardens a way to to bring people together. Um, and uh, promote healthy, healthy eating and, um, and, and food sharing programs. A um, project like this uh, takes a long time, as, as I said, and it takes a lot of um, different, different sources of capital. Uh, what this slide shows is that uh, the HOPE 6 uh, funding, which was uh, uh, a critical component of the uh, financing to make this project, uh, to bring this project to fruition um, was important, but it, we also relied on um, many other sources, $7 million of permanent debt um, overall. Uh, well, I'll uh, direct your attention to the bottom column for the total, bottom row for the totals. Uh, you know, $27 million, that public housing capital funding, that's the HOPE 6, Hope 6 money. You know, working with the city of Jersey City to uh, secure home funds, um, and then working with the state of New Jersey to to secure program score funding from programs such as New Jersey Balanced Housing and uh, the and CDBG funds, Community Development Block Grant funds, uh, Federal Home Loan Bank funds. Um, my apologies, that total is a little off, but I think. Uh, we had about $3 million of federal home loan bank funds, some private equity and from, um, a, a, in the form of a deferred developer fee, but um, uh, $68 million of tax credit equity, was, which is by far our most valuable um, 
resource as affordable housing developers. Um, overall, the project cost 123, almost $124 million. Um, a lot of contributions, a lot of work from a lot of different people and banks and state housing finance agencies. Well, you can move. Um, and a little bit about, I think this is very important, local hiring, um, it's, it's, it's a, always a primary objective. Um, and I'm gonna highlight Glenview phase two. This was the last phase of the community development. Uh, local hiring, local residents and housing authority residents represented 33% of the workforce. That's an incredible, um, incredible uh, benefit of a community like this and a byproduct uh, of the financing. 24% um, of the project was uh, awarded to uh, minority business enterprises and 11% to women-owned business enterprises. Uh, moving on, management is critical. I always say um, communities will look great on the first day, grand opening within, you know, it's really a testament to look at, at you know, what does the community look like in five years? And that's really, um, you know, comes down to, to quality property management and engaged property management. Uh, our, our staff, and we have, we have um, our property management staff on the line, they know every resident, they know about their children, they know about their families. Um, that's important. Um, we also um, make sure to provide, uh, you know, the social services and the, pro to, to, for the promotion of economic stability, health and wellness, you know, vaccinations and screen and health screenings providing educational success opportunities. We have after school programs, which are a tremendous success um, for kids to make sure that they have a uh, productive afternoon after school is, is, is done and their, their parents may be at work. Uh, we, again, those after school programs are very successful. And then partnerships with local food banks, emergency services, health and human services, it, it all brings together the cohesive aspect of transforming a neighborhood. It's not just the bricks and mortar and the pretty buildings. That's only a part of it um, to provide that safe housing so, so residents can rest their head easy at night. It's, uh, it's about um, bringing those other aspects of the social services, the quality management, and an important uh, component of that is also education. And, um, any Michaels resident and every, anyone involved in, or any resident of this community is eligible for a post high school scholarship uh, up to $10,000. Uh, again, that's bringing the three uh, components that we feel truly lift lives, which is the housing, the social services and the education to really have an impact on our residents. And with that, um, I believe one of our residents, um, who, uh, Mr. Small, is, is, is on with us, and I think he's going to speak a little bit about his experience um, as a resident. How you doing? Hi, Mr. Small. Yes, sir. Uh, can you hear us? Okay. Um, yeah, can you uh, say a few words about your experience? Uh, well, um, see, I, I used to live, uh, my aunt used to live in an old project, okay? From down here, you know, I used to live around here. So it, this is just a whole brand new business thing. This is beautiful here now. You know, did you see the trees and the grass and everything? It was chaos way back in the day. This is a very beautiful building now. And the seniors, you know, they did before the pandemic, we would say, you know, we go eat, we go places that had nice security, doctors come in, everything is just very nice place and security is good. So I'm very, very happy. Thank you, Mr. Great. Small. Um, the folks at Donnelly, do you have questions? And folks on the line, do you have questions for the Jersey City contingent? No, nah, I seem nice, but I'm good. <laughs> Um, I do have a question. Yes, uh, Algernon, is that you? I heard that. It is. Okay, go ahead. In, in developing these projects, uh, I noticed that you pointed out that you didn't do a one-to-one -one swap. Um, 
because there's always this tension of getting as many units in an area to make it profitable as opposed to enlarging units and reducing the number in order to uh, keep down the density. So how do you find that balance that makes it um, economically feasible but not degrade the quality of life because people, people might want to have a yard or driveway or uh, uh, for their kids to play or to park their cars. But there's always this tension between <clears throat> maximizing the use of space and then the residents having enough space uh, in order to have a decent quality of life. That's a great question. Um... Sandy, I don't know if you want me to take this one or do you want to speak to this? You can you can go ahead and I'll chime in okay. if I need to. Yeah, so uh, Algernon, the, the, ho the hopes that you're exactly right, and that's a great catch. I didn't mm -hmm. highlight that. It was not a one-for-one -one unit replacement. Um, the the um, I think the deficit was about a 17-unit loss, and that is mainly because the HOPE 6 program allow for that. Unlike this, the CNI program, there's not much flexibility, but um, you're exactly right. It was really to achieve the balance of the, the community space, the open space, and not have an asphalt, uh, you know, impervious um, community um, incorporating those green amenities and those green features. And also, I think what's important is that ownership over your own front door. Um, uh, you, you know, that lends itself to um, needing more space when you're not, you, you know, utilizing um, elevator buildings for every single phase. Um, you need more space. So, I mean, it, it's a conversation with, uh, you know, when you're dealing with, with the funding programs, it's a conversation with HUD. It's demonstrating that, listen, this is what the community wants. This is what the community is asking for. Um, finding the balance, I think, there's many different options. There's many different levers that you can pull um, from a from a financial standpoint. Um, you know, yes, density is important in generating the revenue. I think that the one for one replacement policy is more for making sure that no resident is displaced, and that was the case um, in this in this community. Every resident has the right to return if they unless they found other housing. Um, you know that they that they chose to reside. Uh, but really, um, there's a lot of different options. So from a financing standpoint, as a developer, I would never say that density should be your number one priority. Um, it should be first figuring, you know, understanding what the, what the, uh, what the requests are or what the, what the wish list is um, and starting from that standpoint and, and really looking down, uh, looking at every potential option, every possible option. Um, in this case, I think the group was successful because the community is completely different. It does provide for those open spaces. Um, and we were able to um, you know, maintain the majority of the density. So um, we, we did it and I think it can be done um, anywhere, but it, it takes a lot of hard work. I have a question. Um, back to when the Hope 6 actually um, got started, I know they had some where um, people were mortgaging and then there was some that was renting. And then I heard um, the lady say that um, you guys have market rate. Are these going to be places that people are going to actually be able to afford to live in and not be out like before when people really couldn't afford the mortgage and, and some people said, well, we didn't really understand the underlining um, documents or what was in a lot of people were out of their home because they couldn't afford the mortgages and we visit the ones that was in Washington and Maryland um, when it at first initially started because I was on the board then and we traveled there and we saw them we got to talk to some of the residents so is it going to be the same as the phase when it initially started or did you guys redevelop this where it's going to be benefit to everyone to be able to afford and not just solely market rate where pe some people because 
the economy has changed now due to COVID and other circumstances. So people's income may not meet the criteria as before all of this happened. Yeah. So, so when you, uh, regardless of, of, you know, once you move into a, a, an affordable unit, if it's a rental unit, okay. then um, from the, uh, once you're approved and your income is um, approved to meet the criteria, then you could win the lottery the next day and become a millionaire and you, you won't get kicked out because of your income. So that's, that's housing stability. Um, that's on the rental side. This particular, um, and, and to speak to the market rate units, the, that was a smaller percentage of the market rate units. At the time, um, the, you know, when it was a very distressed neighborhood, the rents, the, the, you know, the rents were lower. Um, in fact, I believe we had trouble renting those. Um, but the rents, you know, as the neighborhood changed, then those those market rate units become more in demand, and then we could we could raise the rent. Those are the unrestricted rents that the goal of the program is to, you know, achieve um, a higher, you know, achieve those higher rents because then it will catalyze. It'll be a part of the catalyzation of the surrounding neighborhood. But again, the goal of the program was a vast majority of the units were were income restricted, and residents could not be kicked out as their income grew. Because that's that's just as a policy standpoint, that's against the the goal of the program. Um, we want to we want to encourage and help residents achieve this income growth. And if they decide, uh, you know, by providing these social services, um, their income grows and they decide to move on, they want to go and live somewhere else. They have that opportunity to do that, of course. But they also have the opportunity to stay. This this project um, did not. It, it initially had a home ownership component and it it ended up not happening and here's why in addition to being a very distressed neighborhood it there was also across urban areas and trenton's not um unlike this there was environmental contamination on this property um and the property that was identified for home ownership um, was not suitable for home ownership residential development so um so this and that's okay. That was uh, allowed under the Hope Six program. Um, CNI definitely has a home ownership um, component co component to it, um, and I believe that how that works is there would be a deed restrict a, um, a deed restriction um, where the um, the 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 resident couldn't once the resident purchased a house and they're buying it at an affordable rate. Um, they cannot turn around and sell the house for a profit as those property values go up. Uh, there are restrictions that pr that that preclude um, homeowners from doing that. So I hope I answered. I think I answered your question. Yeah, you did. Just to, this is Mario with uh, Michael's management. Just to add to Jonathan's point, with the uh, market rate units, we do have. Uh, analysis that are made in the community. So we do uh, charge fair market rents for those units. And I can tell you right now with the experience in Jersey City that uh, about 100% of our units, our market rent units are basically rented all the time. We have very little time where the units are actually vacant. Uh, they're actually sought after by the, by the community um, and and they do very well. And there's there's no, I, I don't see any, any situation where anybody's being pushed out or anything like that. The, the, the market rents are are fair and they're equitable to the community. Thanks, Mario. Um, I want to be mindful of the clock here because I know we have a graduation ceremony also um, in store. And so, and I want to be just respectful of everyone's time. Um, Christy, are there any more questions? Christy, I can't hear you. Okay. All right. I think you said we're good. I, your audio is not very strong, but okay. Um, so, Christy, I'm, I'm going to hand the agenda back over to you. And But before I do that, I want to thank um, our friends from Jersey City and the Michaels organization. And... Uh, So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank mm -hmm. you. And thank you, Mr. Small. Thank you.
Okay. Okay. So we don't. I mean, good ab, Good evening, everyone. We don't have a, a big fancy uh, graduation ceremony, but I wanted to thank each and every uh, individual that participated in our leadership series. I think it was enlightening, uh, inspiring. Mm -hmm. um, we got information uh, from diverse diverse areas, uh, you know, from the planning process to policing to the presenters that came in tonight and really gave us the picture of what is possible and what can be done. So I just, for one, would like to say I'm inspired. Uh, I'm thankful to, to all of our residents who came out, those who are who are here in the room, they have done these weeks with us here in the room, and also those ha who have been on online. Uh, we had board commissioners participate. We've actually had uh, uh, and big ups to Algernon Ward, who took his time, who's a resident of the North Trenton community. And we, the participation, I just think, was, was excellent. And uh, we got a lot of good information. And uh, we, we thank everyone uh, for, for participating, participating in this process. And I will commit to you that this is not the end of our educational series like this. I think um, uh, the young lady, uh, was very, like I said, was very inspirational from the Philadelphia Housing Authority. And I think if we want to revitalize our communities, if we want to uh, improve our communities, then it begins with education and people being informed. So this was a very informative process. And I just want to thank everyone who participated. Uh, big ups to Wu and Stacy, um, who are our consultants who have really been uh, guiding us through this process. Iles and Michael Norquest, and the IOS organization who has been taking the lead on the people, um, the city's involvement, everybody, everybody has been involved. The uh, police department, I mean, we had one situation where something came up on the, on the call and Sergeant Layman sent detectives or sent police officers right over to the situation. Mm -hmm. So I just think that, again, not to belabor the point, but it's been inspiring, it's been enlightening, and we will continue to, to seek to do educational programs like this. Mm -hmm. So with that, I will hand it over to Christy mm -hmm. and Laneri <laughs> to, uh, to acknowledge our participants mm -hmm. uh, for this particular program. Thank yeah. you so much. Thank you so much. Yeah. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you. So I'm gonna acknowledge three residents who attended every session, be it whether it was on Zoom or in person. Uh, the first one is Miss Shelly Robinson over here. Oh, all right. And Miss Amy Baldwin. And uh, actually, they're all here. And Miss Latasha Steps right here. Mm -hmm. So all of so they attended every seven, all seven sessions, and we are proud of their participation. Um, we have certificates for all the residents um, that came to any sessions, I mean, all sessions. We also have bags we're providing with, um, it's a Jaws Spring bag, has North Trent Trace Neighborhood Leadership Series on it, and it has, um, let me just pull out, we have a shirt. Everyone, everyone will receive a shirt. Even people virtually will receive a shirt. We just have to get it to you. And what else do we have? A mask with Trace North Trend, Trace Leadership Program on it. And we also have a mug. So nice. Every every resident will that's been participating will receive it, and Laneri will make arrangements. So, that's that's nice. Nice. Yep. so, and um, okay, and then so we're just gonna go over everyone's names. So I guess we'll read everyone's name. Um, we'll read everyone that's here and then online, I guess, and then we just okay. mm -hmm. so um, who else? Is there? Okay, so we have Miss Elizabeth Marini. Okay, Miss Virginia Marshall, she's online. We'll get you your bag and your certificate. Yep. 
Renee Yeah. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. Yeah. Deborah Stobbs, right here. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Okay, you want me to take that lady? Renee, Renee, she lives in our Hi, Debbie. Hi, Deb. I see you. Yeah, I. Uh, my mom. My mom passed yesterday. So. Oh, oh my God. Yeah. I see you along. Okay. Oh, okay. Good. 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 Um, call me downstairs. Sure. Yeah. And uh, play Sean Pillow. And the Prillo family, I know they were all online together. Oh, at one time. Yes, we got Hello. We're here. And Adrian. Hi. Yeah, she's Hello. here. Okay. And Michelle E. Robinson. Yeah. Khadija yeah. Woodson. <laughs> Latasha Steps. Yeah. And Amy Baldwin. And Annette Falk. Here. Thank you. <laughs> oh. Okay. And I think is that all for today? Congrats, Annette. Thank you. And we also have certificate for all of our presenters. We have Mr. Algernon Ward, who's been on every week with us. So we'd like to. And we have Thank you. Yeah, great. I'm, I'm still Thanks. eating candy from the bridge bill. Michael and Sergeant Lehman. So we thank everyone. Dr. Connolly, I see you on also. Um, and Mr. Gale is going to close us out and say one more thing before we leave and make sure we get on the back. The only thing I forgot, and it's so obvious, I forgot to thank our hardworking THA staff, Christy Huff. Yes, thank you. Hand in hand with, with Lanaria Placencia on this. Thank you, Lanary. And uh, Keith Jones was our uh, manager for the neighborhood. He's been at just about, I think, every session or pretty much most of the sessions. Thank you. And also, and also Freedom and our other staff, our, our other staff members. Mm -hmm who are supporting this process and believe in this process. And I just look for, again, let's work together. Let's make it, let's make it successful so that one day we're giving presentations to another housing authority, right. the yes. same way Jersey, Jersey City and Philadelphia there gave presentations go. to us. That's right, that's right. Thank you. 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 Good night, everyone. Good night. Thank you. 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 And I enjoyed them. Yes. Okay. Do you guys want cupcakes before you leave? Cupcakes? I'll take one with me. Okay. You want to eat? I'm going to eat that one. Okay. Congratulations, graduates. I'm signing I'm signing autographs tomorrow.